Okay, I think we're ready. Uh, yes, I believe we're ready. Hello, everyone. This is my blog about technology. Um, this is episode number 10. Uh, February the 19th, 2011. Okay, first off, I'd like to mention that uh, this will be the first show where I'm using Audor uh, as opposed to Audacity, and uh, it looks like I can do real-time recording uh, with this setup better than I can with Audacity. So I'm using Audor instead. Um, just recently I realized that I can record uh, audio from flash-based radio programs and I used Audacity to do that. Uh, recently I recorded some Radio International Canada using that method and uh, in that case I was using Audacity 1.3.7. Now there's a couple other programs that I've used uh, before. Um, one of them was uh, A-Record or Elsa Record and uh, the other one was uh, Ardor, which I'm using to do this particular program. And of course I used Audacity. So really it's been a very educational uh, experience for me trying to figure out, you know, how do I get the best possible recording? And uh, I'm still using the, uh, uh, the Shure microphone. So, uh, and you know, I've been at this for a few couple months now. So it's been, uh, yeah, it's been uh, quite, uh, quite a challenging experience. Okay, um, now what I wanted to talk about this time was uh, non-x86 motherboards that have PCI slots. And I was thinking, I've been thinking about this for quite some time. I've been thinking, you know, was there ever a computer like that? Okay, we obviously in the old days, old days being late 80s, we had stuff like Amiga and Amiga had Zorro bus. Okay, and uh, if you go back to some of the earliest computers, it had something called an S100 bus. And of course, on uh, early PCs, you had the ISA bus, and you know, so there's all sorts of different things. But of course, uh, nowadays we're talking PCI and PCIe um, sockets. So, but PCI is still quite the most common. Uh, it ended up being the dominant uh, architecture for uh, for slots for computers for expansion slots and computers. Now, um, this is around five years late. Uh, I'm finally getting around to talking about the Ionix PC. Uh, I'll spell that I-Y-O-N-I-X PC, which was an Acorn clone personal computer from Castle Technology. And uh, Castle Technology was based in Suffolk, England. And it had, uh, this particular computer had an X-scale 8321 processor. Uh, a lot of other things, uh, pretty standard CD-ROM, three and a half inch uh, diskette drive, uh, 256 or 512 megabytes of RAM, which ran at 200 megahertz, uh, DDR RAM, and uh, the motherboard had a micro ATX form factor. Pretty typical stuff. Uh, you had USB keyboard, USB mouse. Um, Unfortunately, the, the Ionix is now out of production. Uh, they stopped making them in 2008, and uh, it had a, a RISC OS 5, uh, RISC operating system, and um, it was ROM based, and I'm pretty sure it was closed source. Uh, had a single RAM slot, which once you fill it, you're, that's it. You can't add any more RAM. Uh, the X-Scale processor was surface mounted. Uh, the board did not have an AGP slot. Um, had an NVIDIA GE Force uh, FX5200 graphics card. Okay, I don't really know much about that, except to say that a lot of the NVIDIA cards do heat up a lot. Uh, it had six USB ports, but no PS2 ports. Uh, so like I said, the mouse and keyboard are USB. Um, 
the uh, there was basically a lack of drivers for, for PCI cards. Um, that was one of the complaints people had about the system. Uh, it had a one gigabit Ethernet uh, chipset. Uh, I assume that was built onto the motherboard. I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, it had an 80 gig hard drive, so you know standard stuff. Uh, it had uh, AC97 uh, sound built onto the motherboard. Uh, had two RS232 serial ports with uh, DE9 connectors, and uh, okay, so it had two IDE connectors, 40 pin, uh, that supported UDMA 100. Now um, you could put Linux on this computer, and then you would have an open source operating system. Uh, it came with different styles of cases. You could have a cube style case, or a desktop style case, or a mid tower style case. Uh, Ionix users have recommended using uh, Epson scanners rather than Canon scanners, and this is uh, a problem that we have in, in Linux also. Uh, I would probably say, yeah, in, under Linux, uh, you, to this day, still avoid uh, uh, Canon scanners, and actually uh, most of the HP scanners. Uh, HP used to be good, though. I have an old HP 5200C scanner, which I still use to this day. It's over 10 years old still works fine. Uh, okay, so uh, Intel sold the a, uh, PXA family to Marvel Technology Group in June 2006. So I'm not sure if you're really avoiding Intel by buying a Ionix computer. Okay, um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, older computers. Uh, Stuff like uh, put an old computer together, and then you know, if you do put an old computer together, you, you're going to want some type of efficient operating system because you know, the, otherwise it'll run really slow and you won't like it. But anyways, if we forget about the speed for a moment and just concentrate on the waste heat that the computer produces, we'll find that a P2, Intel P2, 400 megahertz CPU can run with just a big heat sink. Okay, and it doesn't really need to have a fan. So if you build, if you want to build a computer and you want to do it cheaply and you want to do it quietly, then you want something like a P2, uh, 400 megahertz processor, um, and then you don't have to worry about the fan dying. You could get a like a, a Matrox G200 uh, AGP video card, and the point of that is okay, it's going to be slow. All right, so uh, relative to modern modern computers but the advantage is that now you've got a, a CPU and you've got a, a an AGP card video card that doesn't require a fan okay it's probably even possible to use a P3 copper mine CPU without a fan I do believe that is possible I have never tried I've never actually tried it um, okay so this is the problem with G some of the modern GPUs I mean they become like a heating element and if the car heats up too much, it could actually destroy itself. So uh, I'll give you an example. Some of the NVIDIA cards run over 80 degrees Celsius. So yeah, I mean, it's burning up a lot of power. And you know, you might not even need that much. Uh, you know, might not need a, a GPU that's that powerful. Like I certainly don't. There's lots of things I do that don't require uh, a lot of processing power. Um, a lot of times I find myself in console, which is like a terminal emulator, uh, you know, the command line, and it's in text. Basically, it's text. It's it's not really text, though, because it's it's using bitmap graphics still. Um, but the point is that it's not doing any heavy-duty graphic graphical processing. And, you know, so it's not that difficult. You could, you could actually put a fanless system together uh, and even get a fanless power supply and then just choose your parts carefully uh, and uh, you can put a really cheap computer together that doesn't require a fan at all and you know so I mean I th it, it's it, if you can get it so that it never overheats you could put a computer together that could last a very long time probably the only parts that you ever need to replace are um, the uh, the CD-ROM or the DVD uh, drive or the hard drive itself, because those those still have mechanical parts, and they could they're eventually going to fail no matter what. 
Uh, I think the longest lasting hard drive I've ever owned was a Quantum Maverick. It's like a 230 meg hard drive and it's still, I'm looking at it right now, it's still working. Uh, and that's 17 years old, so yeah, that's the record. Uh, pretty impressive. But typically, uh, and unfortunately, hard drives don't last that long, generally speaking. Although Seagate offers you a five-year warranty on a lot of different hard drives. I think they still do. Um, so anyways, I got this box put together. I got Debian Lenny on it, and I got FreeDOS on it, and it's a Pentium 2 400 megahertz slot 1 CPU, gigabyte motherboard, Betox G, 200 AGP video card, so it's a very reliable system, albeit a slower system. Um, but, you know, it makes an excellent backup computer. I actually use it as a file server to backup uh, my important files uh, from the other computers on my network. Okay, um, I'm just going to mention briefly that uh, in, the in the 70s, 1970s, uh, we used to have computer kits that you would put together yourself and as it turns out computer kits are making a bit of a comeback um, there, is, there used to be a computer called the Commodore Kim 1 which was originally the MOS Kim 1 and then Commodore bought MOS of course and uh, uh, so what they've done is uh, there's a company called uh, BrielleComputers.com B-R-I-E-L Computers.com that uh, has produced a kit called the Micro Kim, which is a re-implementation of the original Commodore Kim 1. And it had a 6502 microprocessor with 5K of RAM. And, uh, this, the, you know, this type of stuff is for the do-it-yourselfer. You can get the kit for $99, or you can buy one that's been uh, pre-assembled for $145. But some people they like the uh, you know the opportunity to put these types of things together themselves. Um, now, the one thing that might be a little off-putting is that the video capability on these things is it's got six-digit LED display and that's it, you know. So pretty limited. Uh, really, all you can do is uh, you can look at a four-digit address and you can. Uh, look at the contents of that address. So you've got two digits to display 0 through FF and uh, so six digits in all. Each digit is made up of seven segments and this is like a red LED display. Uh, just a little bit of history. The original uh, Commodore Kim 1 predated the arrival of the Commodore PET. Uh, really the very first computer that Commodore put out and uh, the MOS Kim 1 came out around 1976 and uh, then the, we started to see at the uh, re on retail outlets the, the first Commodore PETs which uh, appeared in October 1977. Okay, that's it. This, is the, this has been the first uh, program uh, using Ardor. Uh, I created it, uh, I ran it under uh, Vector Linux, so just installed it. This is actually my first show, and hopefully this, the quality will be a bit better. Uh, and thanks for listening.